All right. Well, first of all, uh, states exhibits one through thirty six will be admitted for identification. We admitted to states exhibits one through thirty six. And as I said, I have reviewed previously the. Uh, I'll just hand them right here. All right, so those are admitted, uh, and then also. For identification, we also admit as defense exhibits one, two, and three. Two things. Three things. Yes, it's a, that's a composite exhibit, Judge. And uh, just for the record, those are the St. Mary's medical records, the jail medical records, and then the tax reports. And, and the digital aid, I'm not exactly sure how that gets put in the record or transmitted to the hospital. But as they are medical records of the defendant before he gets to the hospital, the hospital should have the prior medical records. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I can order that, and uh, certainly with one and two, um, I guess you could accommodate that. Yes. Get to the hospital. Well, we'll talk about it later. Okay. We'll figure it out. Yeah, but those are probably also be placed under seal based on the, the content, uh, the medical content, the record. Any objection by the state? Okay, then uh, let's make it all of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll order everything. I just yeah, until further order report. State Somebody can. Yep, states and defenses. Your Honor, there were approximately six thousand pages on the St. Mary's records. That's why they're not in documentary. Okay, that's fine. I don't think that'll be a problem, but we'll we'll between the two of us, we'll figure it out. All right. Uh, does this uh, state, I guess, at this point, wish to offer any other evidence or commentary? Uh, not, not for this part. The victim's family would like to take the stand and appeal. Okay. So you assume that. Uh, defense for with this part, with the uh, judge of the defendant not guilty? Anything further? No, sir. All right. Uh, would the families like to speak first? Uh, yes. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Can I look at the defendant, or I have to look this way? You, you, you can look over there if you'd like. Yes. Can I turn That's this? Fine. Yeah. If you'd like to. Um, if you could go ahead and just state your name. Yeah, I'm going to. And please bear with me because I have a lot to say. Okay. A lot. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cindy Mishkan. I am Michelle Mishkan's sister. You can't even look at me? Ma'am, you... ma you would like oh, to. Oh, wow, OK. I am Michelle Mishkan's sister and John Stevens' sister-in-law. I started writing my victim, victim's impact statement a long time ago at a time when I was naive enough to think that there would actually be justice, at a minimum, a trial, and at a time when I thought you might actually care to hear how you destroyed my life, 
and the lives of my family members. In my statement, I told you all about my sister, Michelle, about her amazing blue eyes, about how she went, about how she too went to Florida State, about how we were only 16 months apart and best friends, about how she used to rub my stomach for hours when I was debilitated by terrible stomach aches as a child, and how I bought a house in Jupiter so we could grow old together, sitting on my patio watching the boats go by. Those are just some of the things I was going to tell you about my amazing sister. But that was then, and this is now. Everything changed for me a long time ago, just as the ink dried on my heartfelt victim's impact statement. Everything changed, not because I miraculously recovered from the excruciating emotional pain you caused me, but because I started listening to your jailhouse calls and quickly realized that you were intent on causing me and my family even more unbearable pain. I quickly realized from listening to those calls that you don't care about how your actions have affected me. You don't care about how your actions have affected my family. You don't care that you murdered my parents' firstborn child. You don't care that you, you don't care about anyone but yourself. In fact, the only victim that you and your family see in all of this is you and the hair off name. So what exactly did you and your family say on the jailhouse calls that led me to this conclusion? Well, for starters, your parents repeatedly told you over and over ad nauseum that you did nothing wrong, that you have nothing to be sorry for, that you are a good boy. It's then a toss up for me between two statements that were the hardest for me to hear. It made me realize that you just don't care. I have a question. If I'm quoting, am I allowed to use a swear word? I'm going to repeat that then. It sent a toss up for me between two statements that were the hardest for me to hear and made me realize that you just don't care. The first was having to hear your father refer to Michelle and John as those fucking people with such hate in his voice as if Michelle and John are somehow to blame for their own murders. The second was hearing your father tell you how he celebrated and took the entire office out for drinks the day, the day the FBI lab report came back. It didn't matter to your father that you stabbed Michelle multiple times in the back, neck, and face, that you fractured Michelle's nose, arm, and ribs, or that you knocked out her teeth. No, none of that mattered. All that mattered to you and your father was that the lab report is what the lab report meant for you and your high price fabricated defense and how you could use the report to bolster the illusion or delusion that you are the victim. So what else did I hear on the jailhouse calls that made me quickly realize that you thought of yourself as the only victim in all of this? Well, in one call, you liken yourself to a POW. In another call, you liken yourself to a Holocaust survivor. And in another call, you liken yourself to an African, which I believe you were referring to a slave. Is it really so hard for you to understand that you are just a cold-blooded murderer, not a victim, and certainly not a POW, Holocaust survivor, or slave? Like, how insulting can you be to the real victims? You are disgusting. And how, terrible it has and how terrible has it really been for you while waiting for your day in court? Well, when I was still listening to the jailhouse calls, you were fed three meals a day. You had your magazine and newspaper subscriptions delivered to you. You had your own toilet, your own shower, and for good measure, your own personal phone to use all day long, which you did. You also had a new girlfriend. And let's not forget that you had your weekly care packages from mommy. Listening to you refer to yourself as a POW, a Holocaust survivor, and a slave reminded me of the game on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. So after listening to all your bullshit, I deleted my victim's impact statement years ago. But I am here for a reason. It's because I know that after this hearing today, your team is going to walk out of this courtroom and proclaim victory 
that you've been fully vindicated and that you are truly the victim in all of this. And I couldn't live with myself if I didn't let the world know exactly who you really are in your own words. Because not only did I spend hundreds of hours listening to your jailhouse calls, but I also spent countless nights going through your text messages and notes on your cell phone. So this is who you are, Austin Haroff, in mostly your own words, and in a few instances, the words of your family members and friends whose names I'll leave out. And again, I apologize, this is going to take a while. I'm starting on your phone about one year prior to the day you murdered Michelle and John. August 22nd, 2015. I drove high for the first time, smoked a friend's brother's bong. August 29th, you got kicked out of a frat party. A friend said, you got way too fucked up and they thought you were gonna puke, so they kicked you out. To which you responded, I don't remember, I got too drunk. August 30th, we're going to smoke now. September 11th, and these are all just different texts. Getting fucked up now, getting fucked up tonight. I'm so fucked up, I'm so fucked up, I'm completely fucked up, I'm fucked up. September 12th, I'm so fucked up, I'm fucked up. September 13th, there's a lovely image of you with a joint in your mouth. September 14th, you talked about easy access to drugs due to joining a fraternity. September 19th, I'm ficked up. Getting drunk is so fun. Drank, went to a bar. I was so plared, plastered. I was trashed. I'm going to drink my troubles away. September 22nd, I'm living life in the fast lane. September 25th, I was heavy once into drugs. September 27th, you hooked up with somebody because, quote, I was really drunk. Quote, I'm a douche. Kill me with a knife. To that I say, I wish I could. Quote, I just drank a fifth of vodka, dare me to drive. October 1st, I'm ficked up. October 2nd, I was drunk as hell. Still kind of drunk, literally blacked out. I blacked out last night. I blacked out last night for the first time. Then you said you wanted to do roids to make your legs big. You then said we went to some trailer park and did meth. October 7th, I'm fucking trashed right now. Sorry, I couldn't help you last night. I was so wasted. I didn't black out, but I almost did. October 10th, 10th, bro, I'm ficked up, fucked up. I'm ducked ip, I'm fucked yo. October 11th, I tried to help you, but I was so drunk. I was so drunk, I couldn't even function. October 12th, you didn't know I'm a psychopath? October 14th, I'm actually drunk right now. October 15th, I'm fucked. Drunk at the library again. I always drink too hard. I'm fucked up. Then you wrote, blackout. Blackout till you can't see anymore. Blackout till you fly. Sick, I did meth in some trailer park. October 17th, I'm drunk. Give me the keys. I want to get fucked up. I blacked out again last night. I woke up this morning in his room without pants on with puke and a hole and a hole in my shirt. Your friend said you were going crazy last night. To which you said, I remember nothing. Sounds familiar. Then there's a photo of you passed out next to your toilet, next to a toilet with your pants down and vomit in the toilet. You said, apparently this happens. I wish I remember. Shit. Hate being sober. October 18th, I blacked out. I don't remember anything. October 23rd, on my third blackout, it's four and I'm drunk. I'm trying so hard not to black out. October 24th, I'm already drunk. October 25th, you had a, oh, yeah, you had a friend with, a conversation with a friend regarding whether to try Vivans. Remember those Vivans? You asked your friend to bring you a pill. October 26th, I took Vivans. I drank like three energy drinks. My friend gave me a Vivans October 28th. I blocked out, lost my hat, my tennis shoes, and my muscle shirt. Snapped. I don't know how I even got home. Bro, when I start drinking, I can't stop. 
I ran into a friend and he showed me a pic of me passed out with some nuts next to my face. This was me last night and I had no recollection. I blacked out last night, LSD. October 29th, I wish I wasn't so wasted. October 30th, I'm always high. October 31st, I'm drunk, I'm drunk. We're all fucked up. Hold on, let me get the Addy. I'm fucked up. November 2nd, I'm drunk. November 7th, already drunk. November 8th, I'm fucked up. A friend tells you, you can be an aggressive alcoholic. November 9th, you sold one of your Vivans to a friend. November 10th, crash from Vivans. I'm getting hammered tomorrow. Want shrooms. November 12th, trashed on shroom. November 13th, I need to smoke. November 14th, I want to get there before the all, uh, I'm sorry. I want to get there before, before all the sluts drink the alcohol. I want to get hammered. Me and a friend are, ha are hammered at fresh. Someone said to you, don't get too blacked out. You said too late. November 18th, want drugs. Went to rehab for meth. Need hot girl to, snoke, to snort cocaine off my cock. November 19th, gonna get lit, drunk. November 20th, I was plastered. I was real drunk, drunk. I need help. You were confused by a text message from a girl because you were too drunk. Drunk. November 22nd, let's get hammered. Sounds like a plan. Getting hammered tonight, happy. Need LSD, need meth. November 23rd, give me the keys, I'm drunk. November 25th, hi. November 26th, drunk, I need alcohol. Drunk, drunk as fuck, drunk, drunk. November 28th, I embarrassed myself bad. Blacked out last night and I texted a girl. I have no idea why. Friend says, what did you say? You really need to chill with that. Blacking out. You said, yeah. Your friend said, and the scary chaps, Snapchats? You asked, what did I send? Your friend sent you the image to what you said, I need to give up alcohol. Your friend says, yeah, you need to learn your limits. You said, I'm so embarrassed. Fuck, I, I can't even pronounce it. November 29th, I hate blacking out. I black out too easily. It's a big problem. December 1st, if there is a party in heaven, I plan to leave wasted. On Adderall, feel crazy. On acid, happy. How long do these things take to wear off? December 2nd, I'm popping Vivans and studying for it all day Saturday. December 3rd, need Addy. December 5th, drunk, drunk as shit, drunk. I have no clue what happened, too drunk, feel like an asshole. Dude, what happened last night? Woke up in a flannel. Bring Vivans, nigga. Drink, drunk, done, out, I need roids. Gonna snort Addy, up all night on cocaine. Vivans, I'm gonna be up all night. December 8th, need alcohol. December 9th, I'm drunk. December 11th, I need smoke. December 12th, need heroin, need meth, so high. Poured gin and protein shake. December 17th, I'm getting fucked up almost every day. December 24th, so drunk, meth, heroin. December 26th, I just spilled codeine on my white silk pants. Need syrup, weed, pills, and some Tylenol. December 27th, need alcohol. December 29th, we're drinking my, we're drinking, I'll leave the name out, someone's house if your plans change. December 30th, you made a drug deal to buy weed. Then you said getting high, now so happy. Bought weed from some sketch kid. December 31st, you want to smoke on my boat? Maybe bring some bud. Send Addy. Now we're in 2016, getting closer. January 1st, high and drunk. January 3rd, you asked, did I pass out? Your friend said yes. Again, you don't remember anything. January 5th, wish I could smoke in the dorm. January 6th, need bottle, cheap liquor store near me. Hurry, gotta get a bottle. Friend says, don't block out again. January 7th, drink, got me drunk. Hard to walk home, legit, vision blurred, drink. January 9th, I was so drunk last night. What happened last night? Drank a ton shit of vodka and smoked a shy load. 
Hardly remember anything last night. January 14th, get me some shooter. Your friend asked how many at all do you normally take at once? You said, I don't know, milligrams, and I don't know, let's say for a few hours, take one. Sad, only have six Vyvans. I have five of the 70 milligram Vyvans and one of the 30. Wasted, have Coke, we're gonna do Coke. Can't see, help, it's snowing. January 15th, I wanna get wasted tonight. Need new bottle. Someone says, please be careful this weekend. Don't kill too many brain cells. You responded, LOL. I drank Monday and yesterday already. Drunk. January 16th, drunk. January 18th, blacked out. Could have fucked too, could have fucked too. Blacked, sad. Apparently I passed out in Harmon bathroom with pants off. Sad that I was too blacked out to fuck the girl. Drank fucking Coke and shit last night. Shit black lie, blacked out. Your friend says they should call you blackout. That's your thing. You said blacked out hard last night. Then you're talking about trying, buying more drugs. You said he usually sells them for 10 a pill. I just haggled him to give me a deal. Hooked up with some girl, was going to fuck her, but I passed out in, in her bed. January 20th, I think I'm an alcoholic now. January 21st, drunk. Blacked right now. I'm fucked up. Drunk and guck. Too drunk right now. Can't believe I made it home alone. Going out tonight. Maybe not get that drunk though. Who am I kidding? I had like six beers and a couple drinks last night and didn't black happy. January 22nd. I party harder than you. Well, me and my friend are about to start drinking. I was just extremely hungover and tired this morning. Hey, it's cool if I bring a girl back. She has a prescription. Plus, she's rich as hell. Need her to give me free shit. January 23rd. I wasn't, uh, I'm sorry, I wasted already. January 24th, too fucked. I didn't do anything that I remember. I bought them drinks, that's all I remember. Just don't know what happened. Hardly remember anything. Remember them asking if I was blacked out. Your friend asks, why is a dude sucking your toe? You said, I was... King wasted, fucking. I need syrup and pills and some Tylenol. January 25th, God, I want some liquor. January 26th, need codeine. Need to smoke, need a friend to smoke in the shower with me. January 29th, what's that Addy does? Drunk, wasted, wasted, hammered. I'm so fucked up, drank 14 beers. January 30, 31st, took a 30 milligram Vivane's happy. Too fucked up right now. February 1st, yeah, blacking out is scary as fuck. It's happened to me a couple times, but I try not to get to that point. I got high off a couple hits. Apparently, I walked out of the club randomly, didn't know where I was. I called my friend, and I was near a group of cops. I woke up and thought the whole night was a dream. February 2nd, a friend says, I want some alcohol, man, to which she responded, same. Then you said, might pop a pill tomorrow. February 4th, gonna get drunk tonight. I'm at the front right now, drunk, drunk. I'm easily drunk, brain does not work. February 5th, I wasted, I blacked out last night. God, what the fuck happens, happened. Remember making out, but then nothing else. Help, 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 help. You didn't remember if you had sex with a girl. Don't remember how I got to girl's dorm. Help, help, blacked out last night. Don't remember anything from last night. Getting hammered today, need to drink at Heritage. February 6th, help, drunk. I always get super depressed and angry when, and anxious when I'm hungover, pissed. February 7th, drunk. Your friend asks, what the fuck, Austin? You drunk? You said, thanks, yes. February 11th, got so high last night and had to walk a mile taking an Addy, I don't have a prescription, I just buy it from random people. February 12th, need to black out now. February 13th, drunk, too drunk. February 15th, it's snowing, that's called cocaine. February 19th, hi, hi. February 22nd, gonna get wasted. I do take pills, don't do speed, do do crack, don't smoke weed. February 23rd, snorting all this coke. February 25th, 
going to drink all the rum, happy, February 26th, depressed, because got fucked up for no reason, going to drink all the rum, ducked up, happy, February 27th, at bar with pool tables, coke, drank last night, but going to be sober the rest of the week, March 3rd, coke to library tonight, March 3rd, on Addy, coming down though, coke to library tonight, pop pills and smoke pop pills, your brain's your brain rots. Love Vivans need prescriptions. March tenth. There's a place called heaven and a place called hell, a place called prison and a place called jail. And I'm probably on my way to all of them except one. March thirteenth. Going to smoke with a friend. March sixteenth. I feel like I'm walking a tightrope without a circus net. Popping Percocet. I'm a nervous wreck. March 17th, I'm going to get wasted Saturday, March 20th, Coke back, help me, Coke, help, sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions, I blacked out at like 8 o'clock, I don't remember anything, too confused man, something happened but I don't remember what, legit alcohol is poison for me, you didn't remember dancing on a stage, need Valium, nervous, wish I remember, where did I go, not sure if I had sex but my dick smelled like vagina, Fingers also kind of smell like vagina. Fuck, what happened? March 23rd, smoke weed, take pills, kill people, and drink. March 26th, don't remember anything. March 27th, drank 20 plus brews yesterday, help. March 29th, I'm a serial killer. Bring me some Valium, killing more brain cells. April 1st, need weed. April 3rd, going to take Vivans tomorrow to help me focus. Drunk. I've seen countless dead bodies since I'm a serial killer. April 4th, need Coke. Hook me up. April 5th, I smack women, eat shrooms, and OD. Going to just black out. April 7th, I've only got a 70 for myself, referring to your study drugs. April 8th. I'll just get my friend to buy me alcohol. Help, kind of drunk, drunk, bout to coke. April 9th, started drinking. April 12th, need to be drunk, can't handle reality. April 16th, I almost blacked out, man. I don't even remember the car ride home. Drunk. April 17th, hydrocodone. April 20th, bring me syrup, weed, and pills, and some Tylenol. I just want to be famous. April 21st, at Swan, studying Coke. April 22nd, need to get Blitz. April 28th, I'll probably only get high since I'm driving. April 29th, drunk. May 1st, I'm high. May 2nd, sorry, I was kind of high. May 5th, going to chill and smoke in my garage. May 5th, drinking vodka on the court. I'm high, I'm high. Bring weed to my room. Hi. You really high? Yeah. May 6th, help, doing acid, I'm drunk, on acid, help. May 7th, your girlfriend asks, tell me why you are being extra weird. You said, drugs. She asks, why are you always doing drugs? You said, I'm not. She says, seems like it. May 8th, hi. Friend says, you always hi. Me, hi, <laughs> help. May 9th, literally been high every day. May 10th. I done poured codeine on my white silk pants. Drunk, drunk. May 13th, kind of drunk. May 16th, a friend said, we're getting acid tonight. May 16th, we got blunts. Friend asked, are you high? And you said, maybe. Friend says, why are you a drug addict? You are addicted. I'm worried about you. May 17th, took shrooms. Help. May 18th, I'm high, too high. May 22nd, all I do is go to pubs, lift, and smoke chronic. May 24th, dying man, high as fuck. May 25th, I tried acid and shrooms. I only took one tab and it didn't really, halluc and didn't really hallucinate. You then ask about DMT, which is a hallucinic drug. Your friend says, it's awesome. Because you can choose how hard you want to trip and for how long. You ask, do you know where to get some? Friend says, possibly. 
The biggest supplier in Jensen Beach got busted a few weeks ago, but my girlfriend still manages to get some. Then you talk about buying a half ounce of ganja. You're having some conversation, uh, I'm sorry, May 28th, you're having a conversation about unidentified pills and say, but one gets you high. I'm a stoner, May 30th, high as fuck. I've been getting high every day, just tweeted something because I'm on Vivans, I'm high. May 31st, need to be high. I got a bong, by the way, June 1st, drunk, help, June 3rd, need weed. Your friend asks, you want to come over and smoke and pick up your weed later tonight? And the edibles, your answer, yes siree. Chew mushrooms, took Xanax, June 4th. Talking with a friend about smoking, you said, by the way, do you have my weed? I forgot everything that happened last night, LOL. You asked your friend if he still has your edibles. You said to your girlfriend, you think I'm a drug addict, don't you? She said, LOL, maybe. You said, school by day, drugs by night. Let's smoke Hannah and get high as a kite. June 6th, your friend says, everyone passed the fuck out, though. You said, I sure did. June 7th, I'm 90 days sober, only smoke. June 8th, a friend says, you sorry, bro. I just don't think it's healthy. An ounce is a lot. And another friend's, yeah, that surpasses recreational, LOL. June 10th, a friend says, game for drinking tonight? June 12th, in your notes, he's very snowy, coke boy, do a lot of blowy, crack addict. June 15th, you're making plans to meet somewhere and smoke. June 16th, getting high. June 17th, I just want to be rich and famous. Too high, scared, help. June 18th, need weed. More lyrics about doing coke and Adderall and Vivans. June 19th, give me drugs, give me drugs. Text from your girlfriend. And you're always high when I talk to you. Then you wrote, losing weight, snort coke. Excuse me, I ordered a Diet Coke. Excuse me while I snort this coke. June 21st was so big. June 24th, you made a deal to buy more weed. Your girlfriend says, you are just high. June 25th, your friend says, can we pick you up? We can pick you up. Can I smoke a little at your house before we go? You said, yeah, so drunk, wasted. June 28th, someone says, all your clothes smell like pot. You responded, that's because I hide my pot in my clothes. July 8th, I'm about to smoke with a friend. June 12th, I'm high. June 15th, I'm too high, man. June 18th, I was blazed. June 25th, smoke. June 26th, more buying of weed. I'm sorry, I was in July. <laughs> July 28th, you agreed with a friend. Weed is steroids for your brain. I know, holy fuck. July 29th, you wrote, I find it funny that life really doesn't mean anything. Why the fuck not just do what you want? Just do the craziest shit you can. I just want to be great before I die. Also on June 29th, which by the way is about two weeks before the murders, you did a Google search, quickest way to get famous. From that search, you linked to the 17 ways to become rich and famous without having any talent. High on that list, kill someone. July 30th, syrup, August 1st, two weeks before the murders. You text, I'm gonna blow up, get bit, famous, or die trying. I took Vivans. Your friend says, bring weed when you come. More text about picking up more weed. You said to the friend, by the way, I'm a, dis I'm a stoner. Best decision ever. And again, you said, it's like steroids for your brain. August 2nd, your text a friend, smoke with me. August 3rd, 12 days before the murders. You did a web search for how, how do most people consume heroin? August 5th, 10 days before the murders. Your sister's criticizing your crazy videos. And you said, acting stupid makes everything more entertaining. You think it's weird, but if I do normal shit, I'm gonna just be like every other faggot out there. August 7th, eight days before the murders, you're preaching to a friend about his drug use and your friend throws it back at you saying, wow, you're not a drug addict, Austin? August 8th, seven days before the murders, you text a friend about smoking after dinner. You also discuss buying more drugs, specifically nine edibles. The same day, you do a Google search. How to know if you're going crazy? From that, you link to a site called, what am I crazy really means. And what it said, if you bother to read it, 
what it says is, if you did this search, then it generally means you are not crazy because crazy people don't know they're crazy. August 9th, six days before the murders, you made a mur uh, an arrangement to purchase mushrooms. You said, I don't need any more weed, but the shrooms are good. The drug dealer said, yeah, they're golden teacher, properly dried and cured. You asked, quote, how much would it take me to trip, but not too bad? The drug dealer said 1.5 to 2 grams. 2 grams gives my friend solid, materialized visuals and put him close to the edge of uncomfortable. You then agreed to buy 1.5 grams. You then asked a friend, can you send me an Addy? And a different friend asked you, Why did, what did you guys do besides smoke hella weed? August 10th, five days before the murders. You texted your girlfriend. I realized that even though I wasn't doing drugs all the time, I was still a drug addict. Those are your words. You then texted someone referring to Vivans. I guess I realized I don't need them. And I'm quoting again, I thought I was crazy, but I'm really not. Again, your words. August 11th, four days before the murders, you texted a friend. Quote, I just know that for me, personally, the drugs are taking a toll on me. And I can't handle your words. The drugs were taking a toll on you. August 12th, three days before the murders, you texted, quote, I don't think I'm going crazy, end quote. You talked about how the drugs changed you. The drugs changed you. The drugs. August 13th, two days before the murders, you again, you talked about how the drugs were hurting you. The drugs. You said, quote, the drugs made me vulnerable to evil, end quote. On August 14th, 2016, one day before the murders, you purchased a knife at the gun show. You were with your father, who claimed after the murders that you were well on your way to crazy by then. So wait, <laughs> he let you buy a knife when he thought you were crazy? It's just not believable, not believable. And then just two and a half hours after purchasing that knife, you know what you did? Do you remember the Google search you did? Two and a half hours after purchasing a knife. You did a search about the Thanksgiving massacre when someone killed four of their family members and pled insanity as a defense. Sounds like somebody plotting a murder to me. The same day before the murders, you wrote in your notes, quote, I can't be tamed. I can do whatever I want. Just know it has consequences. I was called the silent killer for a reason. I can be a good actor. Then the night before the murders, you had a perfectly normal perfectly normal late night conversation with your girlfriend. Nothing crazy about it. And now we arrive to August 15th, the day of the murders. Another totally normal conversation with your girlfriend. Your sister, who's apparently claimed to be terrified of you and locked her doors at night, texts you to pick her up so she can go to the beach with you doesn't make sense. You texted your mom, nice guys finish last. Like to know what that means. Your dad asked you on the afternoon before you killed my sister, did you throw the drugs out? Did you throw the drugs out? You didn't answer yes. You know what you said to him? <coughs> Learn. What does that mean? Are you ever gonna tell us what that means? And then you had another totally normal conversation with your girlfriend. 
Uh, what I found really enlightening was the comments of your friends on your text messages after you killed my sister. These are their words. I won't use their names. Maybe he did flaca. He was definitely on something. He did do flaca. Dude, he wasn't a psycho. It was the drugs. He's famous now, LOL. He got what he wanted. His friends probably got coke or molly that was laced. So I asked myself, why are we here today? Why is there no trial? Why is my family being denied justice? I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I have been a practicing attorney in South Florida for over 30 years. And I have read the insanity statute. It's actually very basic. It starts with the following words, quote, all persons are presumed to be sane. All persons are presumed to be sane. And the statute ends with, the defendant has the burden of proving the defense of insanity by clear and convincing evidence. The defendant has the burden. So what does all this mean? Number one, it means Austin Haroff is presumed sane. Number two, it means that Austin Haroff has the burden to prove the defense of insanity. And number three, it means that Austin Haroff has the burden to, to prove the defense of insanity by clear and convincing evidence, which means that he must present evidence that leaves the fact finder with a firm belief or conviction that it is highly probable that the factual contentions of the defense are true. So the state literally had to do nothing to disprove the defense. It could simply have turned Austin Haroff's own words against him and used his own words to poke holes in the factual basis for the opinions of the defense experts, which are outright lies. But yet here we are, opening the prison doors for a double murderer. Four words come to mind. White, rich, boy, justice. I have one more thing to say before concluding my statement, and it's about the FBI lab report. It clearly states under the heading limitations that the FBI laboratory does not have a validated method to test for the active ingredient in psilocybin mushrooms. And let's not forget that Austin Haroff purchased much mushrooms on August 9, 2016, seven days before the murders, and wanted to know, quote, how much would it take me to trip but not too bad? I think his words speak for themselves, but what's my opinion as compared to all the smarter people in this courtroom? And in concluding, I actually am going to give a victim's impact statement, but it is not my own. It is the victim impact statement of my daughter, Perry Mishpon, who is hopefully listening by Zoom somewhere. She loved her Aunt Michelle and Uncle John so much. She was 12 years old and in seventh grade when they were murdered. She's on anxiety medication. She regularly sees a psychiatrist. She's afraid of her own shadow. She won't go downstairs at night in our own home unless the shades are down. I can tell you dozens of ways in which you, your murders have affected her, but I'll let her tell you in her own words. She is now a freshman at the University of Florida. She is hopefully watching this by Zoom. This was her college entrance essay. She called it, quote, everything doesn't happen for a reason, end quote. And here's what she wrote. Everything happens for a reason, a saying I have been told too many times, a saying that I constantly struggle with, a saying that I lost faith in long ago. Through loss, tragedy, and pain, I have been told that everything happens for a reason because what would be the alternative? It's a concept too painful to come to terms with. Horrible things happen for no reason, but how is one supposed to wrap their head around that? A horrible thing happened to my family for no reason on August 15, 2016, an unimportant day for most, but for me, this is the day my life changed. I remember being in a great mood because I had just received my seventh grade schedule and my best friend was in most of my classes. That's when I heard a loud, indescribable sound coming from my mom's room. Was it laughter, screaming? The closer I got, the more distinct it became. 
At the time, I didn't know what it was, but in retrospect, it was the sound of someone losing a loved one. A gut-wrenching sound I will never forget. When I asked my mom what happened, I didn't know that her answer would strip me of my childhood. She cried, someone killed your Aunt Michelle and Uncle John. I fell to the ground, finding myself making that same painful sound. Never could I have imagined that my two favorite people would be murdered in the comfort of their own garage, a place I had always felt safe. By the next morning, my phone was plastered with headlines like cannibal frat boy killer and couple fatally attacked in Jupiter, Florida. Before I could process what happened, the world knew. And eventually, when the world moved on, I was expected to as well. But how could I? This happened five years ago. And yet there has been no trial. No justice. The man who killed them has a renowned legal team whose strategy is to delay the trial until the public's memory fades. For one third of my life, my family has been battling for my aunt and uncle. I've watched my mom stay up all night for months on end, painstakingly searching through the evidence, despite the fact that she's a single mom with a full-time job. I would hear her cry from the other room when she felt I was asleep. Throughout this process, I have felt helpless, out of control, this feeling inspires me to help victims of violent crimes, like my family. Being a an attorney will give me back control, knowing that in the future, I can give people the help my family didn't have access to. Though this tragedy walks with me every day, it has, it has made me strong. When grief strikes, I know with time I will heal. However, I still wander, ponder daily on the why of it all. Why did this horrible thing happen? After racking my brain for every possible explanation, I have come to the conclusion, the conclusion that this happened for no reason. My aunt and uncle were killed for no reason. Once I accepted this, I was able to move forward because I realized that although they died for no reason, I could learn from their passing. I learned how important it is to tell your family you love them. I learned to say goodbye like it's your last. I learned that we can define our own reasons for why something horrible happens. If this wasn't my family, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't care as strongly for others as I do. Now, when I see a tragic news story, it sticks with me because these are people who have parents, siblings, kids, nieces, and nephews. I felt what they felt, what they, I felt what they feel, and now I know how much it hurts. And that concludes my victim's impact statement. Thank you for listening. Thank you. You can come on up if you'd like. Um, hi, if, go ahead. I'm Jody Bruce. I'm also Michelle's sister. And as I sat to write this, I realized that my thoughts were all over the place. And there is really no way I could say everything I want to. So I hope that I can at least express some of what I've been thinking about for the past six years. There have been so many nightmares. So many sleepless nights where my thoughts won't stop racing. And so, so, so many tears. I'm used to order. I'm used to being in control of everything. And this legal experience has been anything but that. It's been confusing. It's been disappointing. And I've never felt so helpless. I'm frustrated with our criminal system, our court system, I'm frustrated with the state attorney's office, and I'm upset that I don't feel anybody has paid attention or cared about this case in the way that they should have since day one. We've had a revolving door of attorneys. Not one of these attorneys sitting here today started on this case. And I hear a lot when I ask questions. I wasn't here then. I don't know. I don't know what happened then. The judges were rotated to different districts. And I think we're on our fourth victim's advocate. Coincidentally, she couldn't be here today. Victim's advocate, really strange name for that position. There was never, never any advocating for me or my family. 
They are simply a li liaison to the state attorney's office and the victims. By way of example, it's a four to five hour round trip drive here from where I live to the courthouse. And I've been to every hearing for six years. And like everything else did, things moved to Zoom during and following COVID. There was a hearing by Zoom and there were technical issues and I had no sound. At the next hearing and the first, the first that I couldn't attend in person, I asked our advocate to please be sure Zoom was working. She said, I can't be responsible for that. The last time it happened, the judge said, if it's important enough, then they will be here. Why would she share that message with me? Not an advocate at all. We learned that the death penalty wasn't an option in the news. No phone call, no email, no heads up, literally sitting, eating dinner with my husband, TV's on, look up to see my dead sister and brother-in-law to learn that information. Thank you. Where was the advocate then? Recently, we were informed that the state attorney's office gave up on a jury trial. And then less than a week ago, on my birthday, the day before Thanksgiving, that one of our experts won't testify because of a medical condition. And then the other was denied the opportunity to interview the defendant. And with that, they gave up on the case entirely. Just like that. Completely gave up on my sister and my brother-in-law and my family, and in essence, the entire community. For when he walks, you gave up on everybody. Imagine all those texts you just heard and all that we've heard about no drugs in the defendant system. My sister just put the case on for you. That is sad. That is sad. But so important that everybody now knows who you are and what you did daily for over a year leading up to the murders. Like daily, clockwork. Can anyone imagine this? Can you guys imagine this? I think it's important to note that the expert that couldn't testify because of medical conditions testified a month ago that he shared with the state attorney's office that he wasn't able to testify in 2020. And then he shared it with them again in 2021. I wish you would have gotten another expert and not taken a calculated risk on letting a murderer out of jail. Because that's what it was, a risk. And it did not pay off. I read that a University of Florida law professor said that only about 1% of felony defendants try an insanity defense because the bar to succeed is so high. Job well done. About a quarter of those succeed. Job better well. And it's usually in pretrial. It's a shame that the defendant in this case that you prosecuted now falls into that statistic. That is so sad. I wouldn't want that on my record. In fact, each hearing leading up to today has felt more about procedures and egos than ever finding or getting justice. That's what it's felt like sitting here. Who has the bigger ego today? Who fights harder? Who gets paid more? That is not justice. That is exactly what my sister called it. You're lucky. You're lucky your dad went back to work to pay for your defense. We're not as lucky. The defendant bought a knife the day before the murders. His father paid for it with his credit card. He was at dinner, having dinner. He got angry and he left. He wasn't crazy in the restaurant. And when the neighbor, Jeff, came into the garage, you said, you want no part of this. You want no part of me. 
and you were standing next to my sister. And then you hit the neighbor with your hand and you started fighting with him. And when you spoke of the neighbor, you were conversing with him. You were threatening him. You were telling him to leave. You knew right from wrong. And you could appreciate the consequences of your actions that night. You can stare into oblivious, but your ears should be working well. We've been waiting to talk to you for six years. Look at us when we speak. You are basically telling him to get out of there. You had a weapon in your hand and you swung at him. You knew exactly what you were doing. I didn't really know you could bur brutally, like brutally murder two people, attempt to murder another, and not even have a trial. That was news to me. I didn't know that. I was more naive than my sister, honestly, up until like last week. I said, we got this. Everyone's gonna hear what happened, and how could we not have this? To learn we so don't have this. We have nothing. Can you show the first picture, please? I want you to, to get a sense that my sister and John were like real people. That's our family. Check it out, Austin. Because when I sent you pictures in jail, you were confused as to who you were looking at. Telling your mom, I, I got a picture. It looks like three triplets. I, I don't know. The, the, I keep getting pictures of these people. I was sending you pictures. I wanted you to, to I wanted reminders. So here's one of our family. John's not in it. He was taking it. He loved photography. He, he, he was a photographer. We'll keep it up, please. Michelle had two sisters, a brother, a father, two stepkids, a niece, a nephew that loved her more than any words could ever capture here today. We suffer. I suffer. Every day. And sadly, I will forever. Michelle was our everything. My family's broken. We will never be repaired. Every day is a struggle. My sister was the nicest person. She would do anything for anyone. She was so happy. She had such a great life. She smiled. She laughed all the time. You beat her up. You stabbed her to death. She did nothing to you, nothing. She was totally defenseless. She weighed like 100 pounds. As if that wasn't difficult enough, and in a way a blessing, actually. You also took her husband John from us and from his family. John had two kids, a mom, a sister. Now his grandkids. He loved to fish. They went out on their boat every weekend, every chance they got, really. They used to rent a house in the Keys each summer for a month. We would all go there. We would rotate in and out of that house all month. We had the best time. And I know if they were still here, they'd still be doing that. Can we show the second picture? Those are some of our times on the boat and in the Keys when they rented their house. So you're looking, so let's go there. That was my sister after a big cake fight with her niece. Because that's what people do. They have fun before they're brutally murdered. So that looks like the three people that look alike, right? Then you got a picture of in prison and you say to your mom on the calls, I don't, I don't understand, these people all look alike. Well, because we're sisters. And one of them was the one you killed. You didn't even know that. Their garage was open that night because they gathered there with friends every night. Every night in their garage. They called it the Garage Mahal. They had a sign made for it, the Garage Mahal. It's a place where they entertain nightly, where the people could go, they could relax, they could eat, they could drink, they could talk, they could have fun, because that's who they were. They welcomed everybody. 
and then came you. You ended all of that in just an instant. It's so sad that one person could take so much from so many other people. You destroyed our family. We were close. We loved each other very much. We saw each other often. We traveled together. If I could choose anybody to go on vacation with, it would have been my two sisters. And we went all the time. We celebrated every birthday. There was not a birthday. There were five of us, Austin. There's two brothers and three girls. We celebrated every family birthday together. We all live down here. We all live from Aventura to Jupiter. How nice. We were able to celebrate every holiday, every birthday together, and we did that. My sisters were my best friends. It's not often you have families that love being together, and we loved being together. So let's look at some of those times. Come on, look up again. Can I see the next picture? Come on, give me your eyes one more time, Austin. One more time. Oh, you can't? So let me describe. This is my sister at her last birthday. That would be my niece, the one that wrote the letter that my sister just read. That's Michelle. You killed her. That's Michelle and John at another birthday. Look at them. You should remember them forever because you certainly don't remember what you did that night, seemingly. And now those are the three girls that look exactly alike. Can we go to the next one, please? Thank you. So here, I told you we went on vacation together. We went on two cruises to Europe before you were able to take our life. Those are some of our travels together. Are you getting a sense of what you took? Like attaching real people to this, real lives, real everydays? Can we go to the next one, please? That's my dad. He's not here today because you basically killed him the day you killed my sister. He has not bounced back since. You killed him that day. He has not been in good health since. He has not been happy since. Imagine, imagine that, Wade, losing a daughter. You have one. Imagine it. And losing her in the way my dad lost his. It's pretty sick. It's hard to imagine, right? It's like unfathomable. Because that stuff doesn't happen. You'd think we paid attention the one time it happened. And that's who saw John the dog. I think you met the dog that night, actually. Do you ever take the time to think about what you did? Should we all take a moment now? The severity of it, the finality of it, the pain you caused, the suffering you put them through, us through, me through. Doing so must be really overwhelming. So imagine what it must feel like to us. The panic that moves through me when I think about what happened. Try and imagine. The nightmares. Going through each day, but not really being present. Always feeling sad, crying all the time. And then realizing it's going to be like this forever. It's pretty unimaginable. Well, this is now our reality. Our every day. Because of you. All of the hearings have made me physically sick. To have to see you, sit in the same room as you, listen to your attorneys give bullshit excuses on why you did what you did, hear all the gory details, you tortured them, and you have tortured me for the past six years. And so the wrath of Austin continues. In the beginning, I used to consume my time, like my sister, listening to your jailhouse calls. All consuming. What does Austin have to say today? 
It must have been so nice to have a phone in your room so that you could stay connected with your family every day, all day. And I heard a lot on those calls. Again, in your words, Austin wanted to know who's responsible for this solitary confinement crap. He was so disappointed that they were analyzing everything he says. And again, in his own words, this is crap. The crap they're putting me through. The chains, the supervisors, the not letting me see my lawyers face to face. And I'm going to be here for another year and a half, which is what I'm pissed about. I guess you didn't anticipate it would have been so long. You must have been really pissed when the year and a half passed and you had like four more to go. Wade, as my sister indicated, you referred to my brother-in-law and sister as those fucking people. Interesting terminology to refer to two dead people that your son killed. Those fucking people. You refer to this as just a two-year blip. Then we'll get past it. You told Austin that we will get through this bullshit. You've called black people the N-word. You degraded Jewish people. You've talked a lot about your Jewish colleagues that are dentists. You've had really nasty things to say, Wade. You're a racist. What kind of person are you? I really could go on and on because there's hundreds of thousands of hours of calls and you are that nasty of a person. You said horrible things about your patients as well. You called your son doing mouth surgery on your patients. You would hand them the phone and say, here, talk to Austin. What? You bought your son a knife, the knife, the day before the murders. You bought him one of the murder, murder weapons. That would haunt most people. <laughs> that would haunt most people for life, but not you. If we want to know who is really the insane one in the Hara family, it is you. You are crazy. You are gross and you are disgusting. Mina, as a mother with a daughter, I thought you would have some compassion for our family. I mean, imagine if your son did to your daughter what he did to my sister. Let's imagine that. She did because she locked her doors at night. But nope, I never heard you express any remorse for our family either. Never. Shake your head all you want there in the back, sister. You locked your doors because you were scared to death of your brother. You should have done something sooner. You both said your son acted strangely for weeks leading up to the murders. And you even set up an appointment for him to be evaluated. You should have done your job better, quicker. You should not be purchasing him knives. Gee, let's make him an appointment to be evaluated and now let's go buy him a knife. Let's call the, fi let's call the uh, police that night and say, some I think something's really wrong with my son. Your parents, you should have been better. You should have done more. You failed miserably. And because you failed his parents, my sister and brother-in-law are dead. Did you heard those texts, right? Did you know what your son was doing in college? You were paying for him to be there. Do you know that? Did that disgust you? Did you really sit here for the past six years believing that toxicology report, thinking he didn't do drugs? Did you? Did you think that? I saw his sister. I saw you shaking your head. You must have known what was going on in college. Crazy. 
No one in your family has taken any responsibility for what has happened, not even you. I hate you. I hate you all. I hate what you did. I really think you deserve to die, Austin. Your family deserves to suffer the way my family suffers. And sadly, I don't think anyone in here is going to ever suffer how Michelle and John did. I don't think anyone ever will suffer. From what I hear, could be one of the most gruesome murders ever. So maybe nobody will suffer like them. I know the kind of people you are, so I know my words mean very little. I hope that the photograph showed you a bit of the lives you took and the ones you destroyed by taking Michelle and John from us. I hope those images will haunt you forever. But just in case they don't, and your memory fades, I will continue to send you reminders of the life they had, just like I did when you were in prison. I'll keep them coming throughout my lifetime. Judge Bauer, I hope there's a consideration, whether anyone thinks the defendant went insane or not, that allowing him back into society where he could do this to another family rests on you. I hope that he stays wherever you are sending him forever, and if not forever, for at least my lifetime. Or I hope society is ready to live with a person like you. Because if you get out and I'm alive, I will call attention to it. I hope you spend the rest of your life thinking about this. And what a horrible person you are. The murderer, drug addict, that you truly are. Thank you. State? Mason Mishcon, uh, Michelle was my sister. Was Austin insane? That seems to be the only thing anyone has cared about for the past six years, not the two dead people that he butchered. It does not seem like anyone really cares that Michelle and John are dead, not his parents, not the defense, the county, the state. Everyone just wants to get this over with so Austin could get a slap on his wrist and go home and go on with the rest of his life. He will be back home in a matter of months, not years most likely. Was Austin insane? I don't think so. He knew what he was doing that night and he still remembers exactly what he did. He's just too much of a coward to tell us. He can't speak the truth. He's been coached by his defense, so he would be able to fool so-called experts to say he was insane, but they were not there. They didn't read all the texts. I think my sister did a lot more than what the prosecutors have done. We would have been a lot better off if she was sitting at that table. But let me tell you what is insane. When the police showed up that night and saw Austin on top of John beating and stabbing him to death and more, and Michelle's dead body in the garage, they chose to let Austin survive. They saw a kid in a nice neighborhood and decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. They said they did not want to shoot him because they didn't want to hurt John. Well, John is dead, and you didn't help him. What you did allow was Austin to live to fight another day, and when he's released, anyone he hurts will be partly your responsibility. And make no mistake about it, he will hurt more people in the future. That is insane. You know what else is insane? That we are even having this conversation. Austin brutally butchered two people. And whether he was insane should not even matter. Let's take two people. One is Austin and privileged white kid, wealthy parents, 
that could afford great attorneys and coach him, manipulate the system, so he is ruled temporarily insane. And he'll get a slap on the wrist. And then take most everybody else that can't get great attorneys. They commit the same crime with the same state of mind, and they will go to prison for the rest of their lives, possibly even get the death penalty. That is insane. You know what else is insane? That Austin's mother, father, and the rest of his family, they told everyone how crazy Austin was acting in the days and weeks leading up to the murders. So what do they do? They buy him the murder weapon. That's great. Good parenting. Two beautiful people butchered in their own house. They were minding their own business. And your son walked onto their property and beat and stabbed my sister, who was 100 pounds. You attacked John then while he was walking his dog back. John, you beat and, I mean, sorry, Austin, you beat and sliced open my sister. She's 100 pounds. And Wade, what do you say about that? You are saying he didn't even know those fucking people. You are a first-class scumbag. You show no remorse. No one in your family did. This is just an all big inconvenience for all of you. And all you care about is getting Austin home as quickly as possible. Because we inconvenienced your life. Michelle and John, what were they thinking? They happened to get in front of John in Austin's knife. They should have just not been there that night, right? That is insane. Do you know what else is insane? Probably the most insane thing of all. That all of this happens, there's two murdered people, and we're not even going to have a trial. Two people are butchered, beaten, stabbed, sliced open, and much more, Austin. You remember all that. And we're not even going to have a trial. The state decided, nope, sorry, Martin County, nope, no trial. It's not worth having it. That's insane. Don't you have a duty to the state of Florida and Martin County and the victims to try and fight this? Maybe you will surprise yourselves and get a guilty verdict. But I get it. It's easier just to throw your hands up and quit. When the tough gets going, the prosecutors just go home and roll over. That's insane. You know what's not insane, Austin? One day you might actually have some remorse and want forgiveness. Maybe that day is today. Maybe it's next week. Who knows? But if you would like forgiveness, I'll give it to you. You just have to do one thing, Austin. You do the same thing to yourself that you did to my sister. Okay? That's all you have to do. Do to yourself what you did to my sister, and you have my forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rocio Mishkon. Uh, Michelle was my sister-in-law. This is very short. Before today, I used to think that the U.S. was the greatest country in the world. And I felt very proud of myself to have moved here. But now, after I see the outcome and the development of this case, I feel very disappointed with the legal system and the justice or injustice applied to this case. Two innocent people were minding their own business in their garage. And this criminal came and attacked them for no reason and killed them. He was caught in the act of killing two people, almost three, brutally, not accidentally, brutally, with full intention. And now what is the outcome of, the outcome of this? He eventually, sooner rather than later, be free in the streets and maybe he will have another episode of insanity. And what is the state to protect us people? The people. He will eventually also be able to not only free, be free, but to profit from this case. 
The media is out there waiting for him. Interviews, books, movies, you name it. He might be famous. What about the innocent people being killed? What about their families who never in six years received an apology? Never an apology in six years. No, from the murderer or his parents who obviously raised a criminal. You raised a criminal. I was raised in a way that if you make a mistake, you apologize. Let alone if you kill two people. What kind of example are we leaving to the next generations? You can go, do drugs, get high, have fun, kill people, and you get away with it. As long as daddy pays for the attorneys, right? All of that with the negligence of the prosecutors from the day one of this case just disgusts me. That's all I have to say. Start. I want to let you know that my brother is also on Zoom, John Stevens, and after I go, he would like to give his statement. Mm. He's able to do that. He's there. He's there? Just have to put his mic on. <laughs> my name is Ivy Stevens. I am the daughter of John Stevens and the stepdaughter of Michelle Stevens. Every morning as a child, I would sit staring out the front window, anxiously waiting for my dad and Michelle to pull into the driveway to pick me up for the weekend. It was my favorite day of the week. I would grab my bag, run out of the front door, and do a running jump into my father's arms, absolute, absolutely elated by the fact that I was spending the weekend with him. They always had some fun activity planned for our time together, whether it was the beach, climbing trees, board games, or even just a movie night with an endless amount of popcorn. Some of my fondest memories with them involved playing hide and seek for hours, dancing in the rain, and cruising around in Michelle's burgundy Land Rover with the windows down, blasting music. To me, it didn't matter what we did as long as we were together. Even at a young age, I can remember craving their presence I long for the week to be over, for it only to be Saturday morning again. I have wonderful memories of them, not only as a little girl, but also as an adult. Even though it might not have seemed like a blessing at the time, I was lucky enough to have lived with them as an adult. They took me in when I needed help, as all good parents do. When we weren't working, we spent our days on the boat and our nights in the garage, talking, drinking, and laughing. Some neighbors and a few close friends of theirs would always head over after work to hang out in the garage with them. It was like clockwork every night for years. The same people, the same drinks, the same jokes. My dad and Michelle were like magnets. They attracted people to them because of who they were. They were fun, genuine, caring people who just wanted to be happy and make everyone around them happy. They built an incredible life together, a type of life and love for each other that I don't believe many people will ever be able to attain. I feel so lucky I was able to spend those three years with them because I was able to learn who they were as individuals. I saw both their good and bad as they did mine, but it only strengthened our bond along with the love and respect that I had for them. After they died, Michelle's sisters found dozens of love letters that had, they had written to each other over, I'm sorry. After they died, Michelle's sisters found dozens of love letters that they had written to one another that spanned from the beginning of the relationship. Along with the letters, every birthday and anniversary card had been saved from the very beginning of John and Michelle. 
inside contained words of affection, admiration, and endearment. Reading these letters only reinforced to me just how much they had cherished each other, what 24 years of love had made possible. My dad and Michelle were wonderful. I missed them with my heart and soul. I wish I could sit in that garage with them again, see their smiles one more time, give them one more big hug. I wish I could tell them thank you for everything and how much I love them, but that opportunity was taken away. Despite the beautiful memories I have of them, the reality of what happened to them the night they were murdered has overshadowed those precious moments. They are difficult to remember, almost forgotten. I have to dig deep to find them. I have to pry them to the surface to remember the good. Now, when I think of my dad and Michelle, I envision them lifeless and mutilated. I picture their bodies cut up, torn apart, and covered in blood. When I think of Michelle, I try to imagine how she felt when she found you staring back at her. How her breath left her body out of fear. I wonder if she tried to run or if she was too paralyzed by fear to move. When I think of her, I wonder how much horror she had to endure before she became unconscious or if she even lost consciousness before she succumbed to her injuries. I cannot even begin to imagine how terrified she must have been when you attacked her, beat her, stabbed her, broke her nose, knocked out her teeth, slammed her head so hard into the concrete that you partially scalped her. I wonder how slow her death was if she begged you to stop when you're on top of her, stabbing her to death. Think about how small she was and how easy it must have been for you to break her. Now, when I think of my father, I immediately think about the last words that he spoke. The words that ring in my head over and over again. Help me. Get him off me. Please help. Help me. Get him off me. Please help. The last words my father spoke were used to beg for his life. I think about how weak his voice must have been in that moment, the desperation he felt, how exhausted he must have been from the fight, from the loss of blood, how his body was so close to finally failing him. When I think of him, try to imagine exactly what happened in the garage that night. I wonder if he knew Michelle was lying dead just feet away from him. If in that split second of a moment, he felt guilty for her death because she was the first one to encounter you. I wonder if he died feeling that way, guilty. I think about how slow his death was, how long it actually took for him to die, how torturous, painful, and horrific it must have been to lay there slowly dying with you on top of him, stabbing and tearing into him with your teeth like the disgusting animal that you are. These are my new memories of my dad and Michelle. This is what I live with every day, imagining their deaths, almost obsessing over the answers to these questions. Questions that I will never have the answers to because you refuse to tell the truth. I am so angry that this is the only way that I can remember them now. I'm angry that they won't be remembered for the life they lived before you, only the headlines that you have turned them into. This is what wakes me up in the middle of the night as I lay in bed for hours picturing the way that they died. You have not only destroyed the memory of them for me, but you have caused me to live in a constant state of fear, not only for myself, but for my family. You are the reason I check all my doors at night, the reason I think someone is going to murder my children, the reason I think someone is waiting inside of my house to stab me to death when I get home every day. You're the reason that I now believe life is disposable and can be taken away in an instant. You are the reason I no longer have a father 
and a second mother, why my two beautiful boys will never have grandparents. I feel so terrible for them that they will never get to experience the love that my father, Michelle, could have given them, the memories that could have been made with them, and the lessons that could have been learned from them. My dad and Michelle were good parents, unlike yours, Mina and Wade. I know you're not the brightest people on the planet, but there is no way that you can't realize that my parents' were murders were preventable. Yet another burning question that keeps me awake at night. Why didn't you intervene if you were so worried about your son? Could you not be bothered with another one of Austin's outbursts? You, couldn't, you shouldn't have let him leave your house the night of August 15th if he was acting so strange, Mina. You should have stopped him, reasoned with him, asked him what was wrong, and how you could have helped him. But I guess you figured you let his father deal with it instead. And Wade, you had two chances to fall home out of the restaurant that night, and you chose to do nothing. I just can't seem to understand why you decided to finish your meal with your girlfriend instead of making sure your son was okay. What a concerned father you must have been, grabbing your son by the neck and cocking back to throw blows at him in the middle of the restaurant. I wonder if you ever regret the choices you made that night, because I surely do. I'm certain you were the catalyst for the events that took place that night. Austin might ha have been the one with blood on his hands, but you set the wheel in motion. One more thing I want you to think about is what would have happened if Austin made it back to your house instead of my father's that night? Do you ever wonder if the rage and bloodshed he released on my dad and Michelle was meant for you? Pretty sure it was. I hope you feel responsible for what happened and realize the role that you have played in this. The death of my parents could not have been possible without you. I have had to sit in this courtroom for six years as you walk in, Austin. Smirk at your parents and have your back rubbed by your attorneys and reassurance. I've had to watch you be portrayed as the victim, a good boy that wouldn't hurt a fly, someone that shouldn't be held accountable because you simply didn't know what you were doing. I call bullshit. Despite what you are meant to believe by your lawyers and delusional parents, you are not the victim. You are a murderer, a monster, and a coward for not taking responsibility for what you did. You have ruined lives and taken others. You have caused inexplicable grief, a sadness that cannot be cured, pain that will ache and live inside me for the rest of my life. I hate you. I hate you with every part of my being, and I will never forgive you. I hope you suffer for the rest of your life because that's what you deserve. Unimaginable suffering, the kind you inflicted on my parents. I hope you never find peace, love, or anything that could resemble a normal life because you don't deserve to live one. You can hide behind your faith in God, but when your day comes, just know that he will not accept you. God rebuffs the devil. He does not invite him into his home. He will never forgive you either. I will wallow in the moment when both of your parents are gone, when you know what it feels like to finally be empty and alone, to be left behind without that unwavering support. I wish you the worst in life, truly. Although, I think you did a pretty good job of setting yourself up for that already. 
You are a disgusting human with a rancid soul, a sick animal that should have been put down a long time ago. You deserve nothing more than to feel despair and debilitating guilt for what you did every second of the day for the rest of your sad, meaningless, and pathetic life. I hope death comes for you sooner than later. And when it does, I will rejoice because only then will justice be truly served for John and Michelle. Thank you. I hope you burn in hell along with your parents. Wade, you're disgusting. Mr. Stevens, is that who you wish to have next? All right, sir, you are John Stevens? Yes, I am John Stevens. All right, the fourth. thank you. Is there anything you would like to say? Um, yeah, so I, I don't have a uh, prepared statement. I think what the Michigans have said and what Ivy have said um, is extremely well said and true. I closed my Part to this a long time ago. Um, I don't live in Florida. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. I uh, live in Kansas City. Um, I have a job. Um, you know, I think about my family and I think about the success that I've had in life. And I know it's because I had a good dad, um, a dad with principles and who raised me well. Um, you know, I have a wife and two kids. My daughter was three months old, his first grandchild, when you murdered him, Austin. And I didn't have as strong of a relationship with him growing up as I did. Um, I was always much more serious, a little bit more of a mama's boy. Um, stay at home a lot of those weekends when I would go and see him. Uh, but he never let me use it as an excuse, is what I'll say, um, to be an asshole or a monster, um, yeah, you know, and he, he, he had a successful period in his life. And I just think about, I just think about a time when I called him, I think I was 21 or 22 in the Marine Corps. Um, and I asked him for $500 to make a car payment. And, uh, he said he wouldn't help me and I needed to figure it out. Um, and I said, look, man, I'm at the end of my rope. And he said, tie it on and hold on principles, again, raised me well, uh, raised me to be a man. Um, and I just look at you and I do get some level of catharsis that, you know, um, he made me successful. I'm an executive. I'm a father and a husband. I'm an Iraq war veteran. Um, I'm a college graduate. Um, you know, I'm sitting in my million dollar home. And you're sitting there in front of your parents who are doing nothing but financing your power fantasy. You killed a six year old man and 100 pound woman. It's sad and pathetic. Next to your smug lawyers, which, congratulations, by the way, this will look great on your website. And I think, you know, I agree with, I agree with the family. Um, this is just, <laughs> it's pathetic for the state. Uh, the sheriff who didn't kill you on site is pathetic. I know what it's like to pull a trigger on a gun. Um, and I know that if you were black, you would be dead. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I think this entire system is complicit in a racist scheme to get you out and they've been successful and it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, uh, coming out of South Florida, I'm glad I live where I live. Um, and, you know, I, I have no faith in God. Um, I think you'll die and go to the void having lived an unfulfilled life. Like the, like, like a lot of people who are sitting in prison today. But, um, what I do know is that if you do believe in God, you will burn in hell along with everyone at that table with you and some of the people behind you. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about my, my family. One of the reasons I'm not there is his dog, 
who you didn't kill, um, Rebel, is 13 now. He has cancer. He's old. I've been carrying him up and down the stairs for weeks. Um, you know, had to tell my kids that he's reaching the end of his life, which was very sad. Um, and, you know, my daughter remarked, it's like, this is what we remember grandpa by, who she never met because you killed him, right? Um, it's just a sad situation. And I agree with what's been said. You deserve to die. You still can die. It's up to you um, if you believe in justice, right? If you're not a coward. And I, I, I know that you haven't apologized probably because you've been coached not to. Um, I would just say, don't bother. You know. So that's really it. Um, it's really it for me. Again, taking a lot from us. Um, our kids have one grandparent. They don't have their grandfather. I'll just say it again to everybody in this courtroom. Um, my dad raised successful people. He raised good kids who have good families who are successful and contributing to society. <laughs> and I just think it's it's, you know, it's hilarious to me that all your family has been successful in doing is supporting your power fantasy when you brutally murdered a 100 pound woman and a 60 year old man. Sad as shit. And I just look behind you and I can, God, it's so pathetic. And what I'll say is the next time you want to go on a power fantasy, do it to somebody who can try to, who can stand up for themselves. Come find me. Right? Fucking pussy. All right, next. I guess I'm done. What I'll say is, um, I, I and I do think the state should be held accountable. I don't know how that works with lame ass bureaucrats, but I know that if you work for me, you would be fired because you are poor performers and you suck at your jobs. So we'll figure out what recourse we have um, or we'll just make it public how we feel about it. But you all should lose your jobs. That's it. All right, thank you, State. My name is Haley. I live with Cindy and Perry. And I just wanted to come up here. I wasn't prepared, but I want you all to sit here longer and listen to this. And also Austin and I are not too far apart. I was in college doing similar stuff that Austin was doing, drugs and alcohol. I was at a low point doing that, which I'm sure you were. And the only person I ever wanted to harm, ever thought about harming, was myself, and I'm sure you felt that too. And everyone in this room hopes that one day you do do that. And I just hope that everyone here knows what a disgusting person he is. And I feel bad for the parents. I wanted to until I heard everything today. He should have been able to come to you, but all you did was make the situation worse. You enabled him, you put the tools in his hand, and you failed miserably. Austin, I will make sure that everyone around our age knows what a disgusting, scary, pathetic person you are. I hope you never find happiness for the rest of your life. And if you ever have the courage to do something, your bravest act could be to kill yourself. And everyone would be better off because of it. Thank you.
Your Honor. My name is Rich Goodman. I've known the Mishkan family since I was probably in second or third grade, and I was actually married to Michelle early on, and uh, um, we stayed incredibly close friends. Um, when we were together, I was a prosecutor. I worked for Ms. Reno, the Honorable Janet Reno in Dade County, um, and it was a time in which we were young, we were excited about our jobs, we recognized how important they were, but I'm not really sure how good we were. But we were always encouraged to do everything we can to protect the state of Florida, the rights of the st people of the state of Florida. Gets to the point where you take your cases home with you. You live with your cases 24-7. They become incredibly important to you. And until about an hour and a half or so ago, I assume this case was well done. I assume that every stone would have been untouched or touched. I would have assumed that I would have been spending my days working on a case, uncovering things, not relying on a family to present evidence, not relying on a family to do the job that we weren't made up to do. I don't know what went on between discussions among attorneys. Um, there's always the unsaid. There's things that are done behind closed doors. But there is not a soul that can sit in this courtroom, at least on this side, that recognizes that this is a failure. I don't know whose failure it is. I believe in our system. I know it's not perfect. Officers, my God, you guys have incredibly difficult jobs. And it's, 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 it's difficult. But how there can be a sense of accomplishment or a sense of this is ending or a sense of we did the best we possibly could, there's not one soul in this courtroom that thinks that happened. I hope this makes you all better lawyers. I hope it makes you understand the impact of failure. And I appreciate the work that everybody else has done, especially in the courtroom. Uh, defense attorney has an obligation. They have an obligation to do what they have to do. We were always told that we represented the rights of the people of the state of Florida. We did everything humanly possible. We lost cases. We decided not to prosecute cases, but we never gave up. Thank you. No one's going to speak. I just want to close. I didn't know. I just want to close with how we open. Um, so I don't know if the order has already been signed, but you've heard a lot today. And I, heard, I think you've heard that we feel there's been no justice in this case from the state of Florida. And if you can rectify that by making the correct decision and acknowledging it was not insane, right? They asked you to do their job in the beginning, pointed that out to all of us, that he was not insane, and that, that the defense, that he was not insane, and that the defense got him off, and instead to just do justice. Put him in prison for the rest of his life, because I think you can do that. I think judges can do anything. So you've heard a lot. Again, you weren't here in the beginning. But they did ask you to put a stamp of approval on what these they have all decided. We don't feel that way. So if there's anything you can do differently, and if you feel differently, and if you have the wherewithal to say, great, I know how you feel, but there's going to be a trial, then do that. Whatever you can do that you think makes us feel that more justice took place, we'll ask you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything further from the state? Uh, no, we're not from the state. Anything from the defense? No, Judge. Not at this time. All right. Um, <clears throat> with regard to some of the things uh, that were said, especially uh, Ms. Bruce at the end with um, uh, the request is
When the parties stipulate to an agreement and they enter into an agreement, the court can always reject stipulations. But I want to go through some things, and I'm going to just address, and hopefully this somewhat answers the question and maybe is a form of education also. I'm not in any way saying it other than for what it's worth. The focus of this case, I'm sure for the state and I'm sure for the defense, even when they're looking at it, is the death of John Stevens, Michelle Mishkan, and Jeffrey Fisher as far as the attack. And the fact, okay, put the COVID time in it where there were delays, let's say a year, year and a half, it's still the case has been pending over six years. And I can tell you from just being involved the last four years, even though some of that was limited with regard to COVID and the delays because of that, the parties, at least what I have seen and what has been filed, have worked very diligently in the case. I'm not saying mistakes aren't made. I'm not in any way picking one side or the other. I'm just saying that it does appear that everybody has been working diligently to present their side. While the burden is on the defense to show or prove insanity, the state does have an obligation to follow the law too. And I want to cover this insanity thing. Not the law, I'm not going to read the statute, just in general. That even first year law students, one of the first things you learn in criminal law is that you need to have mens rea and actus reus. You need to have a criminal mind, a mental intent, and you need to have an act for it to be a crime. So with the insanity defense, which has been codified or really established by the court system for McNaughton was 1843. I looked it up. That was like the big case in England for putting in writing what needs to be done for an insanity defense. It's not a defense to a crime. It's really a defense to being charged with a crime, ultimately when it comes down to it. Because if you don't have the act with that mental intent to commit an act, then you didn't commit a crime. Essentially, that's what it says. And in this particular case, three doctors, because really all three made the determination of insanity. Dr. Gamache said, well, that happened, but because the mental illness was created by past use of alcohol and drugs, he created a legal question there. But really, the defense doctor, the state doctor, who I think we'd all agree that between the two of them, there's a lot of respect for what they've done in their lives. And I've heard both state and defendants over my years as a judge state that Dr. Landrum is somebody to be relied upon. So bottom line is the state's got to follow the law, just like the defense has the obligation to present every defense that is available to it. The state needs to follow the law, too. And if this sounds a little like I'm defending the state's actions, I've seen them work diligently, do things, request things, ask for things that they feel are appropriate, and to try to advance the idea of defending against the defense. But in the end, they do need to follow the law. I have a note here. Defense is ethically obligated to assess the defendant's mental health, both for competency and insanity. They're obligated to do that in every single case. I used to be a prosecutor. I used to be a defense attorney. I've been doing this for 18 years. Generally, most of my time has been in the criminal field. Obviously, all of it as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, and then most of my time as a judge. Regarding the claim that there's 
purchased or bought for defenses or the outcome might be based uh, on something other than the facts and the law, I have to disagree. The vast majority of insanity defenses that are raised in front of me, at least in my years, have been public defender cases with indigent clients. And the doctors don't care when they're assessing somebody who the attorney is who's uh, because they have an obligation uh, and an ethical obligation to, to do what they do. And um, in any event, that's uh, that's just the fact of the matter. In this particular case, the defense and the state have agreed to this particular outcome, I'm sure based upon all the facts and circumstances that they have. It's a sad case, it's an awful case, it's, but nobody's losing sight, I can tell you I'm not, of the death and the injuries that were sustained in the case. But when it all gets said and done, um, the, the, the state and the defense have, have made a determination that that mental intent was not formulated, that it wasn't there. And therefore, the, the defendant is technically not guilty by reason of insanity. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to accept their stipulation. I'm, I'm going to read it into the record. I'm going to enter a follow uh, the, the written version also. And here it is. The issue of sanity of the defendant at the time of the offense has been raised in accordance with the provisions of Florida law. The defendant, by and through his counsel, obtained the services of Dr. Philip Resnick, and the state returned the, uh, retained the services of Dr. Gregory Landrum to examine the defendant and to report to the court on whether the defendant was insane at the time of the offense and whether the defendant meets the criteria for commitment to the Department of Children and Family Services as provided in Florida law. And the court, having received those written reports of the named experts in relation to the issue of the defendant's sanity at the time of the offense and whether the defendant meets the criteria for the commitment, the court hereby makes the following findings of fact and conclusion of the law. The defendant was charged by indictment with burglary of a dwelling with an assault or battery while armed, two counts of first degree murder with a weapon, attempted first degree murder with a weapon and that was from an incident that occurred on August 15, 2016. The court does find that the state has met its burden, both by the stipulation and the documentation that's been provided, in establishing the crimes charged. On August 15, 2016, the defendant did unlawfully enter or remain in a dwelling, the property of John Stevens or Michelle Mishkan, as owner or custodian, with the intent to commit an offense therein, and in the course of committing the burglary did commit an assault or battery upon another or was armed or did become armed within the property with a dangerous weapon. And that the defendant did unlawfully with a premeditated design to affect the death of any human being, kill and murder John Joseph Stevens III, a human being, and in the course of committing the offense did carry, display or use or threaten to use or attempt to use a weapon. The defendant did unlawfully with a premeditated design to affect the death of any human being to kill and murder Michelle Mishkan, a human being, and in the course of committing the offense did carry, display, use, threaten or use to attempt to use a weapon. And Austin Harriff, the defendant did unlawfully with premeditated design to affect the death of any human being attempt to kill and murder Jeffrey Michael Fisher, a human being. And during the commission of the crime, did carry, display, use, threaten to use, or attempt to use any weapon, in this case, a knife. Second, the defendant suffers from a mental illness, which was bipolar one disorder, most recent episode manic with psychotic features. Three, the defendant filed a notice of intent to rely on insanity defense pursuant to Florida law. Four, the defendant was evaluated by Dr. Philip Resnick and Dr. Gregory Landrum, who both opined that at the time of the offense charge, the defendant was suffering under such a mental defect that he was unable to distinguish right from wrong or understand the consequences of his actions. Dr. Landrum found that due to the defendant's illness, he is manifestly dangerous to himself or others and therefore meets the criteria for commitment to a secure treatment facility of the Department of Children and Family Services as provided under the law. The state and the defense stipulated and agree that the defendant was not legally sane at the time of the offense and is therefore not guilty of the offense by reason of insanity. 
Therefore, the court finds that the defendant is found um, not guilty on the offenses charged in the indictment for the cause of insanity due to mental, Ill mental illness as defined in Florida statutes. The defendant currently meets the criteria for involuntary commitment to the Department of Children and Family Services as provided under Florida law and Florida rules. And in that, the defendant, because of his mental illness, is manifestly dangerous to himself or others. Based upon those facts and conclusions of the law, it's ordered that the defendant is not guilty of the offenses charged in the November 8, 2016 indictment by reason of insanity. The defendant meets the criteria for involuntary placement with the Department of Children and Family Services. The defendant is hereby committed to the Department of Children and Families to be placed in a secure mental health treatment facility. The clerk of the courts directed to forthwith forward a, cop, a certified copy of this order along with copies of any written reports submitted to the court by the experts relating to the issues of mental illness, manifest dangerousness, and commitment. Copies of any other psychiatric or psychological or social work reports submitted to the court relative to the mental state of the defendant. All exhibits submitted by the state and the defense at a hearing, at any hearing. A copy of the charging uh, instrument and all supporting affidavits or other documents used in determination of probable cause to the following email address and, and, and uh, written address. I, I won't go through those. Upon notification of admission by the Department of Children and Families, the Sheriff of Martin County shall, on a date specified, forthwith transport and deliver the defendant to the treatment facility des designated by the department, together with certified copy of this order and other documentation as outlined above. The department, through the administrator of the facility to which the defendant is admitted, shall report directly to the court with copies to the attorneys for the state and the defense on the issue of the need of continued commitment under Florida law. In the event the defendant's presence is required at any hearings in this cause, the court will issue an order of transport directing the sheriff of Martin County or his designee to resume custody of, the, of and transport the defendant back to the jurisdiction of the court. This court retains jurisdiction in this cause pursuant to Florida law, and the defendant shall not be discharged or released from commitment within the Department of Children and Family Services without a further order of the court. The court further orders uh, the following special conditions be imposed as part of the defendant's commitment. No contact, direct or indirect, um, with any of the victim's families in this matter. And that will be the order of the court. So I will enter that when I get back uh, into uh, my office. i got to make a couple modifications that I see on it, but um, that's what's going to be entered. All right. So, uh, Mr. Haroff, you're going to uh, continue to be... Um, a resident of the Martin County Jail until the Department of Children and Family Services um, takes custody of you. All right, everybody, good luck. We'll take just a little bit of recess to let the audience clear out.